there we go. And so um, the Growing Coalitions Technical Assistance Series is a seven part series that is uniquely designed for state, territorial, local, tribal, and cultural coalitions. And it will cover a range of topics that are salient to every type of coalition in the first food field. Topics for these sessions will range from communications to advocacy to DEI um, and more. And access to these sessions are completely free, but space is limited. So please keep an eye out for any of the sessions that you might be interested in and make sure to register. Today's topic will cover how coalitions grow and evolve. State, territorial, local, tribal, and cultural coalitions serve as powerful vehicles for achieving policy systems and environmental changes in the lactation landscape. To achieve the vision of rising and thriving families in all communities, coalitions must be prepared to grow and evolve in order to meet the ever-changing ever needs of the communities that they serve. And with that, I'm happy to pass it over to today's subject experts, Linda Kopecki, Elsa Quintana, and Pashetsky. Um, Linda, I'll pass it over to you to introduce yourself and the rest of our facilitators. Hello, everybody. My name is Linda Kopecki, and um, I greet you. I bring you greetings from St. Paul, Minnesota. I am the interim executive director of the Minnesota Breastfeeding Coalition. Hello, my Colorado friends. Um, I'm also with the Twin Cities Regional Breastfeeding Coalition, but formerly of the Boulder County Breastfeeding Coalition and the Colorado um, Breastfeeding Coalition. So um, happy to see many faces that I, I, I will see many faces that I recognize and I recognize many of the names. And I'm, I'm just so pleased to have some wonderful co-presenters today. Uh, one is Posh Shasky. So I work closely with Pa in Minnesota, and she's with the Twin Cities Regional Breastfeeding Coalition, and she's also with the Hmong Breastfeeding Coalition, that's H-M-O-N-G, Hmong Breastfeeding Coalition. And also Elsa Quintana. Elsa is with the New Mexico Breastfeeding Task Force, but more specifically, she's uh, uh, in a leadership role with the Binational Breastfeeding Coalition. Binational, you heard that. So U.S., Mexico, um, but also two states, so New Mexico and Texas. And Elsa, would you um, please do the greetings? Elsa, you are on mute. You have to unmute yourself. Oh. Okay, sorry, technical difficulties there. Um, uh, I want to welcome everybody. Uh, we really worked hard at trying to um, get this going. And just to get welcome everybody, we're hoping that you get a lot out of it and help uh, grow your coalitions. So did you know that there are 567 federally recognized Indian nations, variously called tribes, nations, bands, pueblos, communities, and native villages in the United States? Additionally, there are state recognized tribes located throughout the United States, recognized by their respective um, state governments. You can learn more about the uh, more about it um, from the National Congress of In American Indians. Thank you, Elsa. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Um, so Hi everyone. Again, my name is Pash Yasky. Um, so we are so uh, glad that you guys are have all taken your the time out of your busy schedule to be with us today mm -hmm. um, for this session. We hope that you learned some tricks uh, and tips on how to grow your coalition after our time together. Um, but mainly, we hope that by the end of this session, you'll be able to identify the indicators of a static coalition. Second, learn some basic elements of how coalitions grow and evolve. And lastly, we hope that you'll be able to list some resources that will help your coalition um, grow and evolve as you um, leave this session. So you have a few ideas for next steps. Next slide, please. Um, so this is Linda again. And I just wanna comment that um, we are talking about 
coalitions of all types. So local coalitions, and many of you are part of more than one coalition. You may be part of a state coalition, a tribal coalition, a cultural coalition, regional, local, um, or you may just be part of one. But this is about how individuals' coalitions grow and evolve. But it's also how they interact because in a certain area, in a state or a region, you, your coalition doesn't exist in a vacuum. You exist with other coalitions and you're existing in the same space. We think of that as a garden. So we all are within the same soil, breathing the same air, but you need different things. Your coalition may be highly evolved and the coalition that's occupying the same space, but maybe it's a cultural coalition. Um, they may be uh, a newer coalition. And so how do you work together? How do you support each other as you each grow and evolve? Mm -hmm. Next slide, okay. And so this is Elsa. Um, all coalitions um, grow and evolve. And what we've come up with is sort of four stages of coalition growth and evolution. Um, the first one is uh, formation. Um, you, those are brand new coalitions or they're reformed coalitions or leadership is just emerging, uh, activities are just um, being defined. So you're barely starting and uh, maybe in a small group in just your community. Then we have the, the next stage is implementation. Um, usually all these coalitions are all volunteer coalitions. They have few activities, maybe not meet as often. Um, but they do have already sort of like a, mi a, a mission and a vision and a plan that they're working on development. Then we have um, the maintenance uh, coalitions that fall in, in that category. These are established already uh, coalitions. Um, they have diversity is prioritized. Uh, funding and activities are closely aligned uh, with the mission. Um, some of the, and we'll be discussing more of funding and um, diversity and all of that uh, in the next slides. Um, then we have the institutionalization. This ones are, these are the, the uh, coalitions that are already established. And they actually um, are a coalition that model equity and inclusion. And so we have several uh, throughout the United States. Um, so when we're looking at this, what I'd like to do, I, one thing we didn't mention, we're gonna be asking you to use the chat box, you know, to put, put a lot of input um, versus rather uh, opening up the mic and then uh, having everybody talk. So look at each of the stages, the four stages, and can you please start, uh, where do you identify your coalition or your coalitions? Like me, I have, I belong to two coalitions. And so I can tell you like mine is, uh, one of them is in maintenance and the other one's in, already in institutionalization. So I'd like to, we'd like to see where your, where your coalition falls. Let me give you a few minutes. Nice. Okay, so I see that we're all kind of all yeah. over the board, which is great. We have some that are formation, some that are in between stages, some that are institutionalized. That's wonderful. Um, for those of you who are already up at the institutionalized um, uh, stages of your coalition, don't don't lose heart. I promise we have some stuff in here for you too, and for your coalition as well. So so pay attention. 
Um, so let's walk through the first stage uh, together. So formation. Formation is the first stage. Elsa had mentioned that this usually means that the coalition um, is in the stages of um, generally developing the procedures of their vision, mission statement, their leadership, their communications method are all still, again, being developed, right? Nothing's formal. Usually the funding availability will drive what the coalition does. So an example of this, could I go to, uh, could you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. An example of this is the Hmong Breastfeeding Coalition, which I am a part of. It is a cultural coalition and it's probably a year and a half, maybe two years old now. Um, but the coalition branched from a community-based breastfeeding project where the participants who, who were part of that project started to meet together monthly to carry out some of the ideas that had been expressed and uh, that were developed during this uh, community project. Um, there were no formal agendas and future meetings really were like on an ad hoc basis. We usually, uh, you know, at the end our at the end of one meeting, we would say, okay, when should we schedule the next one? And it would be maybe four weeks out, maybe, you know, six weeks out. So we really didn't have any formal um, agenda. And then once we decided as a group to become a coalition under the Minnesota Breastfeeding Coalition, uh, we began to have more regularly um, scheduled meetings uh, with uh, formal agendas. However, right currently, we still don't have a mission or vision statement and our activities mm -hmm. are based heavily off of the grants that we are able to receive. Um, now, we're gonna walk through a scenario together uh, for the formation stage. And throughout this presentation, we will, we as the presenters will be asking, we'll have a scenario to pose and then we'll launch a poll for each of you to answer on your screen. So after I read the scenario, a poll will pop up on your screen for you to answer. And I want you to know that there is no right or wrong answer. Um, each coalition is unique and they will take different pathways to meet their need in order to grow and evolve. Okay, so this first scenario, let's say that your state coalition has been working with your cultural community to review available data, conduct listening sessions with WIC peers and elders, and to review available lactation resources. What would be a good next step if you want to form a cultural coalition? Danae, would you please launch the poll, the first poll, please? Thank you. So I'll give you guys maybe 30 seconds to answer this. Again, no right or wrong. What would you do mm -hmm. if you wanted to form a cultural coalition? Okay, give you guys maybe another 10 seconds. To answer. Right now we're at 50% of our participants. Yes, and unfortunately you can only choose one. I know I wanted to answer more <laughs> than one as well, <laughs> but you, you only, can only choose your top one. Again, no right or wrong answers here. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're at about 80%, Pa. Okay, another five, five seconds, another five seconds. Get your, get your vote in. <laughs> okay, we'll close it, Danae. Thank you. Okay, so the results. Okay, we're kind of all over the board, but the main mm -hmm. one with 56% is engage members of the community to conduct in a, a needs assessment. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, I, mm -hmm. This is great. Um, you know, again, no right or wrong answers. Okay, so let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So that's kind of the formation. Uh, stage. The next stage is implementation. Now, in the implementation stage, leadership, membership, roles, agendas, policies, and activities are starting to formalize. Usually, mm -hmm. there are more community members that are engaged and um, being recruited as part of members for this coalition. So the mm -hmm. community assessment would have been great because then you make them aware that you're creating this cultural coalition and you start to bring them on board. All right, next slide, please. All right, so an implementation example. 
So another breastfeeding coalition that I am a part of is the Twin Cities Regional Breastfeeding Coalition. Now this coalition has been around for probably three and a half, four years. Um, and I would say that we are in our implementation stage. We have a planning team that meets monthly to discuss and plan the upcoming coalition meetings, even you know the, year, the upcoming year, kind of like, what are we going to do for a world mm. breastfeeding month? Uh, you know, what are we, so, so we have a, a planning team that's able to do that. Uh, there are formal agendas and meeting minutes that go out. Um, there's a listserv of coalition members and we have monthly announcements that are communicated through MailChimp. And MailChimp is uh, a marketing platform, a virtual marketing platform. Now this coalition has a website that highlights current coalition partners, initiatives, and opportunities that we as a coalition have available to community members and or community partners. Um, and there are also two subcommittees in this coalition that meet every other month to complete various lactation projects. All right, so let's again walk through a scenario together and then I'll, we'll launch a poll. I remember there's no right or wrong answers to the poll. So let's say that you belong to a newer coalition and you have leadership from WIC, public health, and the hospital, the medical clinic, the medical world. You feel like you are doing everything to keep the coalition going. You want to get more people excited about the coalition. So there is a critical mask of regular participation. What is a good next step for your coalition? Okay, so Danae, could you please launch the second poll? Thank you. Okay, so we'll give you about 20 seconds to answer. So Pod, this is Linda. I'm just um, thinking we're doing really well on time. I'm wondering after people respond to this poll, perhaps we could um, invite people to open up their microphones and comment on these mm -hmm. first two stages before we move to the mm -hmm. next stage. Okay, perfect. Will do. Thanks, Linda. Okay, we'll give you maybe another 10 seconds. Okay, we are at 40% participation. I know it's so hard to answer just one or to have just one mm -hmm. answer. It is hard. <laughs> it is. <laughs> All right, 66% are waiting for those other votes to come in. Paul, you let me know when you're ready for me to close that, okay? Sure. We'll do five more seconds. Okay. Danae, will you close the poll, please? I will. Thank you. All right. So creating, again, we're kind of all over the board here, but creating a special invitation for specific community members to join the coalition membership. Very, very good next step. Again, no right or wrong. Um, I want to say that with our Twin Cities Regional Breastfeeding Coalition, that is what we did. And actually, we are currently in the throes of inviting specific coalition members to be part of the leadership team. So very good next steps. All mm -hmm. right, so before we move on, before I turn the time back over to Elsa, let's talk a little bit about formation stage and implementation stage. Are there any brave souls who will be willing um, to share maybe your experience with your coalition um, in one or in between or you know, one of these two stages. And you can just unmute yourself and uh, maybe say your name, what coalition you're part of, um, and go for it. Hi, Anna. Hi. So I'm in Virginia uh, near the beach, southeastern Virginia, and we just started ours. We're sort of just finishing the first stage and starting to move into implementation. So there had been some folks working on breastfeeding for about two years here. And then there was a grant got to say, let's form this coalition. So I'm the head of that. And 
we're doing a lot of these things that we're just talking about, recruiting people, doing community assessment, getting members from the community from all different sectors to come aboard. Um, so this is really right where I'm sitting at. So yeah, nice. that's really been interesting. Nice. And Anna, does it help you to kind of like see the lay of the land with these different stages? Yeah, it just makes me realize that some instinct I had like about actually coming up with a purpose statement. That's what we just finished. And we came up with a name and it's I can see people stop holding their breath like, OK, you're serious. We are going to get some work done here. We're not just going to meet and meet and meet and talk. And there's something going to happen. So that's been really exciting to see the members start to say, OK, let's give this a name and a purpose statement so that we're real. So that's really exciting. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing, Anna. Um, anyone else? Would anyone else like to go? You can just unmute yourself. I can't see everybody, so. <laughs> yeah, um, my name is Randina Hoyt, and I am the uh, president of the Pikes Peak Breastfeeding Coalition here in Colorado, in Colorado Springs. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been in the implementation stage for quite some time. We did start picking up pace a few years ago, um, but uh, we, with the, COVID hitting and um, everything coming to a complete stop, we are having a hard time getting back up and going. Um, we did have a lot of people who were attending regularly, um, but uh, now all of a sudden we can't seem to get many people to participate. I mean, we're doing our you know meetings on Zoom, of course, and we're trying to um, you know, get back rolling with, excuse me, I'm so sorry, that's my office phone, um, get back rolling with um, uh, our, our events and stuff that we have going on. We've been reaching out um, a lot of the uh, um, professionals in our community know that we're here. We've reached out quite a bit, but we've just kind of hit a stall. So um, I have a small team of um, the board members that have really stepped up a lot, uh, especially over this last year, but we're really running into um, to that, that being a problem where we're having a hard time getting people to participate again, especially after the beginning of COVID. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm really kind of stumped on what to do because we have reached out uh, quite a bit. I, you know, we send out, um, you know, emails, reminders, things like that. We have a really, you know, good email list um, that goes out, you know, a few times per month uh, with uh, information. But yeah, we're really stalled. Thank you, Rendina, for sharing. You know, um, I'm I'm pretty sure you're not the only coalition that's dealing kind of like with this, like you said, being stalled because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I wonder if anyone else here. Um, has been in similar, uh, been in a similar situation, and you are trying something out, or you, you know, were able to kind of move around that barrier of having the pandemic kind of overwhelm everybody. Is there anyone here who, you know, maybe have some ideas? I, I just have a question for Randina. You know, did you guys, um, did you guys conduct a needs assessment um, in your area? Because sometimes when you're inviting people um, to your coalition, if it's not meeting the needs of the area, they're probably not gonna participate. So, I mean, I would, that, that's crucial. That's very crucial. Cause you know, it, I, you, know you, you need to know your area and find out what are the needs here. And um, everybody's getting zoomed out actually too. So you might want to start incorporating um, other other uh, agencies or or organizations and see if you can you know kind of partner with them and see where you can go with that. But you know, I mean, needs assessment is biggie. You know, if it's not it's if it's not something that's going to meet the need of of our area, I don't participate. So so there's a you might want to look at that chat section, this is Linda, there's a question in the chat section about just what might a needs assessment look like? Well, what we there, did- There's a variety of ways you can do a needs assessment or an environmental yeah. assessment. It just, mm -hmm. And we, we just conducted a simple one. We sent out, um, we wanted uh, to meet the needs in our, well, I can tell you like in our area, we wanted to impact the uh, breastfeeding rates. 
And so we needed, we knew that um, I, I was previously working for WIC. And so we knew that there was a gap there. We need to bridge a gap between the hospital discharge and by the time they got to WIC. So we wanted to make sure that the same message was being um, delivered to the patient um, in, in order to in, increase and support, you know, the, the breastfeeding mom in her goals, whatever her goals were. And so what we did is we, we, could, we actually uh, submitted an, a needs assess assessment to our hospitals and find out, okay, so what is it that nurses need? Um, we were hosting um, really good uh, 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 lectures um, they, we actually were getting speakers, but but now with the with the pandemic, it became um, uh, webinars, and so we were getting really good ones, but they weren't meeting the needs. That's why I'm asking. They weren't meeting the needs um, for for what we wanted. So you need to find out what your goals are and what your objectives are first. What do you want to work on this year? You know, okay, we want to increase uh, not you know the skills of the nurses, you know, or the medical or bridge this gap. And then what so, we did is that's when we submitted it. You know, we submitted it to the hospitals and we, we inquired from them what it was that they needed. We lactation, we know lactation. I'm an IBCLC, I know lactation, but the nurses don't. So they needed to go back to basics. We didn't need to bring, you know, all these, you know, higher level um, speakers. We needed to go back to basics in order for the nurses to participate. So. That's that, that, that's so, what we did. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Question about leadership, getting people to step up into leadership roles. Um, mm -hmm. And I asked uh, um, Miriam to go back to this slide just because I think there are many points on this slide, uh, many activities that a coalition can do that can inspire and motivate people to step into leadership roles. And I know, um, Pa, you definitely. You've been working with the Twin Cities Regional Breastfeeding Coalition on some of these activities. Rendina, you you look like you had something to say. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess, I mean, we, we know what our needs, right now we're working on um, the breastfeeding friendly businesses right now. So that's, that's our thing for the whole year, right? And then of course, mm -hmm. coming up to um, the big latch on. Those are, those are like the only, the, our big latch on was the only thing that we had really um, focused on um, until we started, you know, to, the, the um, coalition had kind of changed leadership a little bit. And um, so now we've got a lot, you know, uh, more leaders who are, are jazzed up, ready to go, you know, excited. We're working on, you know, trying to implement different things. If they fall by the wayside and, and they, they're not very successful, then we we let them go, right? So we're, we're try I guess we're trying to do a needs assessment that way. You know, we try to do a little mm -hmm. bit of a fundraiser, t-shirt mm -hmm. fundraiser, see if anybody would um, mm -hmm. participate in that. We had a hard time with participation in that. So that's fine. We, we're not going to spend more time, more money or anything like that on any, you know, something like that. We That was kind of a, you know, a little bit of a, a a test run with that but um like for our best breastfeeding friendly businesses we've been reaching out multiple times and saying hey we do need people who are going to be able to step up and you know help us sorry again um uh, but help us with that uh that type of thing and the emails you know uh mentioning it you know during our coalition meetings um you know those kind of things unfortunately people are just not grabbing on to because we are saying that hey we do need help with you know getting the word out to businesses can you even just suggest businesses to us and we'll call them ourselves you know can you help us make calls to businesses to find out who would like to become breastfeeding friendly you know we are getting absolutely no grabs on anything so that's kind of like our we already know what our needs are right now we need people to help us with this stuff but we're not having anybody step up at all, mm -hmm. no volunteers or anything. So all of the board members are taking on all of the responsibility right now, even though if we've reached out via, you know, social media, via email, every time we, um, you know, do our meetings, you know, we're, we're getting the information out there as much as possible. We're talking about it to other business owners, peoples and pe people and things like that. We're just not getting anybody that are active. And so that's, that's where I feel like our, 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 our problem is right now. So Mm -hmm. Rudina, if you hang on to that question, um, we will later on in the mm -hmm. presentation, we'll, I don't think we'll answer it completely for your coalition, but I think we'll have some ideas and tips Perfect. or tricks on how mm -hmm. you can continue to mm -hmm. go on that. Yeah. 
Um, mm -hmm. Danae wrote, wrote in here that we will be sharing, uh, USBC will be sharing some resources in the follow-up mm -hmm. email that we'll send to you guys. Uh, looking through the chat, you guys are putting some very, very good questions in here, right. which is great. Mm -hmm. Some of them, again, will probably be answered by the end of this session. And so if mm -hmm. we skim through it or if I skip it, that doesn't mean we didn't see it. It just means we're probably going to get to that, okay? So I just want everybody to know. Yes, Anna, you look like you have something to say. No, I was just thinking when you were asking about the community uh, needs assessment, one way that we've done it was during like those winter months when we knew everybody was hunkered down even more than normal because, you know, with, with COVID, but even more so in the winter months, we, we had met with a doctor in the fall. And of course they have such a different perspective, like Elsa was saying, right? So then I said, well, let's start with talking with the mamas. So we held like these evening virtual coffees with Anna and moms would come with their nursing bubs and we would just be in our pajamas talking. And I gleaned so much from that, from their perspective, their stories. And then the next group we did was lactation consultants. So we got cons consultants from around the region that typically weren't speaking to each other because they had all thought and heard from years and years and years before that we're in these different camps. And we had this lovely mm -hmm. evening. We had to cut it off at two hours. And people mm -hmm. were like, we've got to do this all the time. And then we went to home visitors. So now we've got these different perspectives to find out. My, our next one is going to be with the WIC peer counselors. So we're getting lots of voices to chime in. And why isn't this working in our community? Why are we still seeing so few moms initiate mm -hmm. or continue breastfeeding? But that was like a light bulb moment talking in these smaller groups where people could just share rather than do sort of a formal community assessment, a survey, people were just burnt out, just didn't even want to hear about that. So anyway. Thank you, Anna. You bring up, yeah, you bring up a good point. Sometimes, you know, having a formal assessment can be a little bit, uh, I guess, mm -hmm. I, I guess I should say the con to a formal assessment is that you know, people have to be able to access it, right? You have to be able to literally get it in their inbox or get it in their mailbox in order for them to fill it out and get it back to you. So sometimes having little, you know, focus groups, for a lack of a better word, um, would be a little bit better than having a community assessment in the sense that you're actually getting stories. So you're hearing a lot of the quantity or, or quality versus the quantity. So thank you for bringing that up, Anna. Um, I, there's a uh, Nakia put Nakia put uh, in the chat that Nacho has a resource called Map M A P P. That's pretty hefty, but you guys can use it. It's full of tools, and so definitely check that out. Thank mm -hmm. you, Nakia, for putting that in mm -hmm. there. And then Nakia mm -hmm. had a question that says, "Why did you choose to go with breastfeeding friendly businesses?" Um, Nakia, are you able to? I'm, I'm not quite sure what you're trying to ask there. Are you able to unmute yourself? Absolutely. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you all for having me. I feel like, a, <laughs> um, I guess like, to, so, so for the original person who was asking that question, um, my thing is, so you're having traction problems with moving forward on this goal of breastfeeding friendly businesses. My experience of doing TA and working with lots of communities around the country is, um, the first question is, why did you choose that thing? And the assessment is, is to first determine what is the thing that makes sense for the broader community to work on. Because when you ask the question first, then you find out what is going to be the motivator to get people to get engaged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Nakia. I think that was to mm -hmm. Rendina. Yeah, thank, thank you, Nakia. Um, that, that was actually a grant that we got from the Colorado Breastfeeding Coalition. So it was actually something that we uh, applied for because they were working on that as a whole. And so since we have applied for that grant and we said, yes, we would love to be able to help our community with this project that you know Colorado Breastfeeding Coalition started um, and helped, uh, then we, we took that on. So um, that was the reason behind that decision, um, not necessarily because we had searched for that as a need in our community, but I feel like it could, you know, it, it's definitely something that is needed in, you know, every community is to really support and promote, you know, breastfeeding friendly businesses and to make sure that the businesses are support, supporting breastfeeding moms, of course. I do think it does fit good in our community, though, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for clarifying, uh, Regina. And, and you point back to, you know, in these early stages, formation and implementation, it really is 
um, the, the activities really are tied to the funding sources. And so if you do mm -hmm. get a funding source for, you know, biz, uh, breastfeeding mm -hmm. friendly businesses, that's what your activity is going to solely focus on because uh, right now you're still kind of in this implementation, you're trying to grow your coalition, you know, you're trying to interact with the other coalitions around you. So thank you, uh, Regina, for the clarification. So okay. Is, yes. Lundra, there is a comment about, or a question, and uh, it posed a couple yes, times sir. about paying, about um, paying board members, paying volunteers, um, or even paid memberships. We're getting into funding. Okay. Yeah. So, should, Linda, do you want me to answer it now a little bit from what we've been doing with Among Breastfeeding and Twin Cities, or do you want me to wait until we get uh, later on into kind of like the... I think that's a, it's a good example of um, compensating participation and also not necessarily the Hmong Breastfeeding Coalition, but also what's been started with the Twin Cities Regional Breastfeeding Coalition. But um, for 501c3s, um, there are IRS restrictions on paying board members, but there are other ways to compensate participation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with the Twin Cities Regional Breastfeeding Coalition, we are able to leverage funding from a state grant um, in Minnesota called the Statewide Health Improvement Partnership Grant. I know that's a mouthful to say, um, but that grant specifically is in Minnesota. It um, works on chronic disease prevention. And so one big component of that state grant is um, breastfeeding support and promotion. And so through our local public health, our Twin Cities Regional Breastfeeding Coalition is able to leverage some stipends to bring in BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, People of Color um, members to the table, the coalition table, to the coalition, uh, the breastfeeding coalition group. Um, I know that when we started up the, the Twin Cities Regional Breastfeeding Coalition, we wanted it to encompass and almost and almost raise the voices of community members versus lactation professionals, right? Um, when you think of breastfeeding coalition, traditionally you think of lactation professionals, you automatically think, or at least I do, I automatically think of, you know, medical clinical staff, you know, um, I don't really think of childcare providers as being part of mm -hmm. um, a, coal, a breastfeeding coalition. I don't really think of, you know, the young moms receiving WIC as being part of the coalition. You know, I'm thinking, oh, they're all professionals. They all get paid to, you know, go to these breastfeeding coalition meetings. And so um, what we did was we leveraged some funding from the state grant to say, hey, could we compensate community members um, especially BIPOC community members to come and be part of uh, this coalition. And we would want them to commit their time to coming to the monthly meetings. We would want them to commit to being one of the, uh, a member, a part of a, one of the two subgroups uh, that we have going on so that they feel empowered so that we get their voices and what they think uh, would work best for their community if we were to go into their community, you know, to, so they could kind of be that liaison for us, our coalition and the communities um, that we want to work in. And so the pro to that is that you do have folks who um, are more willing, community members who are more willing to join because they will be compensated um, mm -hmm. and be getting a stipend for each meeting they attend. The downfall to that is the grant only lasts so long, right? So you're, you're only able to compensate them for a certain time period. Um, once you, you know, for us, it's October 31st of this year. Once that's over, we have no clue what we're going to do. We hope that the community members are vested enough that they continue to come on their own, or we would, you know, or while, or, and, or, we start looking for other funding sources that we can actually continue to pay them their stipends. So um, I hope that answers a little bit of the question. Again, we're gonna go through this presentation. We still have a lot to cover and, and hopefully it'll answer the question. If it doesn't, please feel free to put it back in the chat, bring it up again towards the end of the presentation. Thank you, Pa. Let's move to maintenance, Elsa. Okay, maintenance, okay. So maintenance, um, the coalitions um, are actually meeting um, more regularly. Um, they do have um, 
They do have, uh, there is a format. There's minutes being taken. I mean, I would highly recommend anybody wanting to form a coalition already start. And I think that's one of the things that we're gonna be putting as a resource on, on there is uh, how to host an effective meeting because you, you need to be able to demonstrate uh, later on for funders, especially, and for other professionals that you are a professional organization and that you need, you know, you need that backing um, to show everything that you've done and minutes is, is very crucial. Um, uh, so they, th this is a little bit more organized, uh, clearly defined mission. They already have a mission and a vision and their strategies. Um, these are the ones that drive their funding. That's why I was asking before um, Randina was, you know, what, you know, we, we, you know, we choose uh, what we want to target, you know, what, from the well from the needs assessment that we got and so that's how we look for funding around that um and then there is really clearly defined roles um so we do have a chair we have a treasurer we have a, you know we have the board you know um and um we at this point in time i i can tell you with um um, our coalition, and I would say like the uh, binational uh, breastfeeding coalition kind of falls into that. And I'll explain a little bit more about it where we're, why I think we're in this, in this stage. We're between implementation, but I think we're more maintenance. There, there's active leadership pipeline. There's clear procedures that would need to be followed. Um, and diversity is critical for us. We make sure that there's representation from everybody. We are a binational group. So um, Texas is very different from New Mexico. Uh, United States is very different from Mexico, you know, so we have a very diverse, you know, group, which is nice because we learn from each other. Um, we do conduct uh, needs assessments. Again, we, we do use state level data and resources for that. And it, you don't have to be in maintenance to start looking at some of that stuff. You don't, have to, you don't have to recreate the wheel. There's a lot of resources out there that can provide that information for you. There's other people that have been paid to be able to gather all that information. Um, we conduct evaluations, you know, any of our lectures that we host or any of our conferences or, or meetings, uh, we do conduct evaluations um, to be able to show, you know, have we accomplished what we tried, you know, what we wanted to accomplish. Um, there is high level of ownership and, and membership is, an, is engaged. Uh, it's engaged because we are in our coalition, in order for you to be a member, you need to pay. Uh, so you would have you you pay your dues, and so that's for ours. Doesn't mean that you cannot attend our meetings. Uh, we invite everybody in the public, but again, you know, for voting purposes and all that, you you have to be a paid member. Um, and then there is a clear uh, code of conduct and guidelines uh, for con uh, conflict resolution, um, and and communication plan is uh, complete and rolled out. You know. Um, Actually, for us, it's been, uh, it sounds horrible, but uh, COVID was a blessing for us, you know, because it actually made us launch into this virtual world because we are a binational uh, coalition. And so trying to get our Mexican partners across the border, you know, for them to come to our meetings was not going to happen, you know, so this actually caused us to launch that. And so it took us to another level. And actually our membership has even grown more. And we've done more activities. It, it's kind of funny, but it, we've done more activities during this uh, pandemic um, season. And so it, uh, it you know, it just, uh, I think it's just clearly defined, you know, goals and objectives, you know, that since the beginning, you need to make sure and that you stay on track and that you make sure that you get communication from everybody. Everybody's at the table. So we do have, it, we have, like I told you, a diverse group and we want to make sure we're meeting each of those needs because our, our clients, you know, if we're hospital staff, you know, our, our patients and for, um, or businesses, customers, they're gonna be, they, they travel between New Mexico, where I'm at, um, I'm only like uh, 
about 100 feet from Texas. And so, you know, I'm already, most of my business is in Texas. And so I, I have to cross over. The closest hospitals for us are in Texas. Um, we have um, Mexican partners or people that come and they give birth here in Texas or New Mexico hospitals. So how do we bridge that gap? So, you know, that's what I was saying. You, you really need to assess your areas. Um, but when you're in maintenance, like I tell you, you know, you have, um, we, what's really helped is having a website, you know, that got set up and really that came from partnerships. Um, you don't have to know it all. And I, and I, that's where I, I'm, I've been blessed to, to participate in two um, coalitions that have started from the beginning. And I've seen how it's evolved. And like, I hear some of you, um, you know, I can tell you the New Mexico Breastfeeding Task Force is almost 30 years old. If not, it's already 30 years old. And so I can tell you there were many times that we kind of got stuck in some of the stages and because there was growth. And I can tell you with like senior um, members, it was kind of hard. I was one of those seniors, you know, senior members. And so that was kind of hard to see changes. We wanted, we, you know, we didn't want to get become so strict in, in our policies and our everything, you know, that it, we had to follow, you know, really strict guidelines. You have to for funders, you do. Especially when more money came in, there was more accountability. So it wasn't as laxed as before. You know, we needed to make sure that we were crossing our T's and dotting our I's, you know, to make sure. So um, I can tell you we have, uh, we started our, for this um, uh, by, by National uh, Breastfeeding Coalition to meet the needs. Again, we started the, we called it the Look, Look Who's Talking um, Lactation Series. And so we would invite everybody. Um, uh, what we found also is uh, if you put breastfeeding in a title, most likely the professionals or, or uh, people um, from other organizations are not gonna come. So we just put, look who's talking. And so, and then these are the speakers. We'd invite Dennis to talk about oral development, but we made sure that they covered the breastfeeding piece of it and how breastfeeding, you know, helps with the oral development. We, you know, we were very selective of who we would choose for our speakers and stuff, but we wanted to make sure that we, it was appealing. That's what it really, it becomes appealing to whoever you're wanting to invite. Um, I, I can tell you for uh, being a member of the Chamber of Commerce, if you want to make, if you want to have an impact, it's really, it really is a good um, conversation starter when they ask you what you do for a living. And then you tell them, oh, I'm, I'm a lactation consultant there. Uh, and they, uh, or I, I just say an IBCLC. And then what they say is, okay, so what's an IBCLC? And I go, let me tell you what an IBCLC is. You know, and so then I go over my lactation. They don't even know what lactation is sometimes, you know, what is that? And then I said breastfeeding and they're like, oh, really breastfeeding? Oh, you know, and then, but I start talking to him about the benefits of breastfeeding and that, you know, it's a really good conversation starter. So Chamber of Commerce be, be some of, and I would highly recommend, recommend if you get any funding for, for the uh, business case of uh, breastfeeding that, you use some of that funding maybe to become a member of these organizations, Chamber of Commerce. I know I belong to the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, you know, and, and have those people. Um, also, we use some of that money to, when we got some funding also to um, educate some of our members and how to become good spokespeople, you know, good spokespersons. You know, sometimes you're in an elevator and you only have a few seconds, you know, you meet somebody and all you want to do is, you know, wow, you know, maybe, I, you know, um, we met, we have a really wonderful young girl who is our website um, master, you know, she is wonderful, you know, wonderful, she can do anything. It's really nice to know that I don't have to be a, 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 a um, 
very technologically educated. In other words, it's nice for somebody else to do it, you know, and you can trust them, you know, that they're doing it. Of course, we monitor what's being put there and how everything else, but it's nice to have those. So we've been being, we're able to bring in, we contact the universities. Sometimes those graduate students are looking for a project, you know, for them to work on and, you know, they're in, in anything and dietetics, you know, they're wanting to come in and it's nutrition. This is first food, you know. And so we're inviting people, you know, uh, dietitians, nutritionists, um, speech pathologists, anybody that wants to come. Pediatrician. The, yes. the next, um, the poll is ready oh. to be launched. Oh, okay, next I'm poll. sorry. So that's okay. Yeah, can... so, but you're talking about, you know, <laughs> next on. steps. And this is about a coalition that's kind of stuck. So it's perfect segue. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so your, your state coalition has been around for 17 years, but it seems that the same small group of people are doing all the work, which is, it sounds like this is what's happening. Uh, the leadership is not diverse. A few activities are regular, but your coalition is still chasing money to determine the activities beyond the regular few. What can your coalition do to achieve more diversity and accountability? So Danae, can you launch the poll, please? Okay. All right. We have about 34% of our participants who have participated. I know it's hard. It's very hard. This one is hard to choose from. Okay. We're at about 60%. So also, you just let me know when you're ready. Yeah, let's go ahead and, and close it. Okay. And see what the results are. Sure. Okay, so here, um, it looks like identify possible activities that align with your mission and vision and seek appropriate funding. And yeah, and then the next two, actually we have 11% for both of those, have coalition members participate in another organization board and activities. That's a great way to, um, I, I, I participate in the environmental uh, meetings and they couldn't figure out what I was doing there. And I said, well, uh, if you really wanna go green, breastfeeding is the best way to go green. Uh, review all available data to create an action plan to improve lactation equity. And I agree with that too. Okay, next slide. Oh, there are a few more responses. So if today oh, they are? possibly scroll up, yeah, there's a possibility of eight oh. responses. Mm -hmm. so it's just the little oh. bar on the right. Can you Let see them see. now? No. It's the no. little, it's the bar on the right. If you pull that down, yeah. it'll, it should scroll I, up. Yeah, I, I, can, I can see them but I'm not sure why you all can't. Um, uh -huh. so I can screenshot and, and I'm happy to, to share. Okay. okay, so I don't see them. So I think they the, the participants can pull their, when they see the image of the sharing, they can pull it and they can expand it themselves. Cause that's what I'm having to um, do. I'm having to expand yeah. it myself. Okay, yes, I can see it now. And see, actually, the highest one was seek partnerships with other statewide organizations to co-host activities. And yes, that is true. That is very true. Um, we, uh, with the uh, lactation, um, the Look Who's Talking lecture series, we actually uh, partner with, um, we're partnering with the New Mexico um, Nursing Board to give uh, CNEs, to free CNEs to, um, 
uh, nurses who wanted to participate. And then we'd also get, get um, LSERPs. And then it's with some of our speakers, we were able to get ESERPs, you know, so. And what's really nice is when you partner with other organizations, especially the big ones, and we'll be talking more about that, um, they have more funding. So you don't have to worry about it. They just give you, tell you, they tell you how much money they've got and you just spend it. And then they're the ones that have to keep, uh, be accountable for it, which is nice. Okay. Any questions here? Did we have any chats? Let's see. Regarding I don't see any just... specific questions in the chat section for this. So maybe we go to the, the institutionalization and then open it up for questions after then, that one for okay. these two stages. Okay. Yeah, because they're really close, um, these two stages. Okay, so next slide. Okay, so this one's institutionalization. Um, with this one, this one's more of a permanent organization, and I'll use the New Mexico Breastfeeding Task Force for this one. Um, it, it maintains diverse funding. Um, they really look for, for funding. Um, been through transformation of leadership, membership, and structure. Um, addresses policy, systems, and environmental change, you know, changes. Uh, institutionalizes uh, collective impact principles, disrupts hierarchy, and, and we'll be talking more about that. I'll give you examples. Uh, holds space for and convenes partners um, for shared uh, decision-making. All policies and procedures are grounded in inclusion and equity, and that's very important, uh, especially right now for funding. Uh, uses racial equity analysis to identify barriers to resources and support, and that uh, there's a lot of funding out there for that too. Uh, coalition is a model of racial equity, represents a community's diversity, uh, viewed as a lactation and uh, maternal child health leader in the community. And, uh, and I can tell you, I, I, like I told you earlier, I was, I've been blessed to be able to see how the New Mexico Breastfeeding Task Force has, has evolved. Um, and um, when it first started, uh, one of our, I can tell you that uh, one of our biggest, the way we were able to show uh, big funding, what, that we were able to handle funding was um, we had the WIC uh, promotions uh, manager um, as uh, as part of the group, uh, as part of the coalition. Um, and um, what they did is, uh, if anybody works with government, they know that you do, you do not want to get funding and for it to go to the general fund, because there it can get distributed all over the place. So uh, what they did was they contracted it out. And so uh, when they put it out for a proposal, they did an RFP, they put it out for proposal while well, there's various organizations that can, you know, when it's out there, they can um, uh, apply for the grant. And um, it, uh, because we were so focused on breastfeeding, there wasn't very many organizations within New Mexico that actually focused on breastfeeding besides the New Mexico Breastfeeding Task Force. So they actually got awarded the grant. So it started with um, a few thousand dollars um, and then it, it started growing into even more as uh, if anybody knows about how breastfeeding funding is awarded, it's not awarded by really the size of your state, it's by the effectiveness or your actually your breastfeeding rates. And so uh, New Mexico, as it started evolving, we were able to demonstrate through WIC, we use WIC data um, to demonstrate how um, with, with um, we applied also, uh, well, for peer counseling, I, I didn't mention that, it's peer counselor grants. So we applied um, for the peer counselor grants uh, well, the New Mexico Breastfeeding Task Force applied um, to be the, the fiscal agent for the, that grant, the Breastfeeding Peer Counselor Grant. And they were, and they were able to demonstrate um, how 
you they could manage um, that fund. And so uh, with WIC data, we were able to demonstrate that those uh, clinics that actually had peer counselors, they actually um, it started their breastfeeding rates increased by 10%, you know, that, that what the first evaluation. Then after that, it started increasing even more. Then it started evolving. It went from breastfeeding peer counselors on, uh, there. We started going into the baby friendly um, USA grants. And then, uh, and then also the business case uh, for breastfeeding, they started getting some from there. Also from ASSO, and, that, and I think that one is, I really can't, but it's uh, regarding public, um, public health offices. Those are uh, um, grants that you can get through them. It's an association for state territorial health officials. Yes. Okay. Right, ASSO. Yes. So we, yeah, so we, we applied for some of those grants and really the biggest one was um, WK Kellogg's grant. And so that when they, when that one, we received that one, that one was, I, gosh, it was in the hundreds of thousands of dollars or actually almost, yeah. And so it, when we received that one, that one actually what launched us to an, a, another level, a bigger level. And so from there, um, we were able to get our website. Um, actually from that, they've continued because it's been so successful, the New Mexico Breastfeeding Task Force and utilizing some of that money. And then with the WK catalogs, if um, New Mexico is one of their priority states, um, but they also, if you if anybody is on the line from Michigan, Mississippi, New Orleans, Mexico is another one. So I'm going to be looking into that one with our binational um, breastfeeding coalition, and then Haiti. Those are the priority states. But anybody can apply for any grants that that they have. Um, when from there, I mean, it's just started. I mean, money started rolling in. You do need to establish once once you are at this level, you do need to establish good um, accounting, accountability, and accounting. And like I tell you, the nice part about it is because some of our members that started participating in in our in our uh, or our coalition, one of them was a. Um, uh, she's actually an accountant. So we're currently right now, she's the one that's been an account, the accountant for the New Mexico Breastfeeding Task Force for all this time. So we went to another level when we even got even more funding, uh, not just from um, WK Kellogg's, but from other funders all, all over the place, um, United Way. I mean, so we, we received a lot of funding. And from that, one of the, for the, um, business case um, for breastfeeding. With that one, what they used with the AFSO grant, they also we created what we called um, employment liaisons. What they would do is uh, they would go to the businesses and talk about um, the laws that we had in New Mexico for breastfeeding, breastfeeding in public, breastfeeding, uh, pumping. And so we actually paid them to be able to go out and, and do a lot of this legwork and uh, a lot of this uh, breastfeeding promotion and education. And so th that's how we got, uh, actually how we got involved also with the Chamber of Commerce because it was easier to just go to one place where there's a bunch of businesses rather than go to each and every individual business and try to uh, talk to them. So shall and we move so, to the scenario? Sure. Also, yes. and I, I just yes. want to reflect on what you're saying because I've noticed it um, with our coalition in Minnesota that um, funding can start very small, mm -hmm. but funding pushes your can push your coalition to evolve and grow, and you're eligible for more funding as you grow and evolve. So it it can start small but it can mm -hmm. definitely increase over time, but it also encourages your coalition to um, set policies and procedures and just to be more diverse and, and to be um, uh, have a higher level of evolution, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, so you, this is a scenario. Your coalition has a clear mission and vision that combined with data um, drive activities and fundraising. Your leadership is increasingly diverse. Your 
bylaws and policies are current, and you practice shared uh, decision making. You have partnered with key uh, community stakeholders and organizations to fund creative projects. What is your next step? Okay, I see those okay. responses coming we in. We're at about 36%. I think we want to get to about 75, 80. So we're almost halfway there. We can leave it open for a few more seconds. Okay, five more seconds. Yes. Get that vote in. All righty, we're gonna go ahead and close that poll mm -hmm. and share the results. All right, here we go. Okay. Okay, let's see. I have to scroll down. See if there's any other ones. Okay, really. Um, Thirty-three percent create a review system to ensure that all of activities, policies, and procedures are grounded in equity and inclusion. Yes, that is very important, um, especially as things are changing. Your the diversity of the group changes also. And so you wanna make sure that you're meeting the needs. I know that um, we're gonna have other, other um, TA sessions that we're actually gonna be covering. So I really um, encourage you to, to um, register for the other ones because it's also gonna be talking about making sure how do we keep people you know, within our organization. So. That's, that's just a little tidbit for the next sessions. Mm -hmm. um, the next, the highest of the higher one, let's see, regularly convene, is it regularly convene or leverage funding for community-based activities to reduce lactation disparities? Yeah, and that, uh, uh, having the peer counselor program within our, our coalition, um, being the fiscal agent for that, that was a biggie a big door opener. So any coalition that can handle that, uh, talk to your uh, WIC people. You know, I know that but I, I was previously, I, I retired from the, uh, the New Mexico uh, WIC program. And then I was on contract with them for six years as their um, um, breastfeeding peer counselor um, manager. And so, um, and, you know, through that, I got to see, you know, how important having a good fiscal agent is, you know, to help, it, it really, it helps both, both programs. So really, I would encourage you to get in, involved with your public health and your uh, WIC people. Okay. So should we have people um, unmute themselves again? So if anybody yeah. has questions or comments, this might be a good sure. time. Sure. Benet, can you unmute un us or Miriam? Everyone is um, in control of their mic. So if you'd like to speak, you can go ahead and okay. unmute. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Anybody else doing anything different or any suggestions for either maintenance or institutionalization? I have a question for you, Elsa. Where mm -hmm. does one start to look at lactation funding? How, how, um, how does a coalition even start looking for it? For funding, 
I can tell you that we, um, it was so interesting because actually funding uh, would come to us. And that was because we could, as I told you, we, um, we you, there is a lot of leg room. Uh, I mean, a lot of uh, leg work that you have to do. Get yourselves out there and tell them what it is that you do. Environment, anything that has to do with environment, it, it, it you can get funding from from um, uh, for breastfeeding. Anything that has to do with health, uh, WIC is a big one. You know, talk to your WIC people; they get some monies. Um, we do, we do get some um, extra funding for projects within the community, and so really partner with them. I know currently, right now, I'm working with the Office of Community Health Workers down here in 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 in. Uh, in our area, we do have one in Texas and we have another one in New Mexico. You know, they also get funding. And because we are on the border, we also get, we are able to get some funding from the Office of Border, uh, border Health in New Mexico. And so um, Paso del Norte, I mean, there's like, you just need to be looking around and partnering with other people. And I think we're gonna be talking about that actually mm -hmm. in another one about uh, I think Linda's, one of her slides is going to be giving you some ideas mm -hmm. how you can do that. And somebody had a question about, do you need to be a nonprofit or a 501c3 to be able to seek funding? Um, yes and no. Right. It all depends. Yeah, <laughs> it, it all depends how much money you're asking for. Um, so yes and no. So when we started with the Binational Breastfeeding Coalition, um, actually it was, or, it, and I can tell you what, another thing that I didn't mention with institutionalization, you become, it, it is a, the New Mexico Breastfeeding Task Force is a statewide. And so what, what they would do is they put, would put out an invitation for representatives from the different areas. We have five regions um, within the state. And so they would ask a representative from those regions to participate in their quarterly meetings. So what, what we would do is we'd go up there, I'm in the South, way down South. And so I would go and I would talk to them about the needs of the Southern area. The problem with that is it's not a need within the whole state of New Mexico. It's only with the Southern area. So what we decided to do as a task force, they, we branched out into chapters. So we have the New Mexico Breastfeeding Task Force as the umbrella, but under it, we have little chapters mm -hmm. that cover the needs for our areas. And so we had ours, you know, here in the South mm -hmm. that, that helped. And so they were, so our funder, you know, the New Mexico Breastfeeding Task Force would give us some funding for some of our activities. But it wasn't a lot of it. But knowing your community, you can go to. I know I even we even went and it was so interesting. We went to Price's Dairy, and you know it was all about nutrition. You know breastfeeding nutrition, and so they gave us some funding. I oh, mean I don't know. It's Brenda like, Bandy in the chat section mentions um, some other good sources. So Title mm -hmm. Five. Funding, yeah. um, WIC funding, health promotion funding, if there's some state funding in Minnesota, we have mm -hmm. shift funding. Um, mm -hmm. Also, if you're a small coalition, like a local coalition or a small cultural coalition, I'm thinking particularly of the Hmong Breastfeeding Coalition that Pa mentioned, um, you can find a fiscal agent. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, your state coalition could be your fiscal agent. I know that mm -hmm. in Minnesota, the Indigenous Breastfeeding Coalition of Minnesota is not a 501c3, but they do receive funding. There is a community-based organization that is um, native owned and mm -hmm. uh, it's a maternal and child health organization that is their fiscal agent. So that's their preferred fiscal agent, an indigenous mm -hmm. organization. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But having a fiscal agent can really help smaller newer coalitions get small amounts of funding. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So should we? Yeah. And within New Mexico, we also have a, a you know, we have a large population of uh, Native American, Indigenous, 
And so we, you know, partnering with them, they also, they, they have their own funding, but when you partner together, what, whatever we couldn't purchase because of our, whatever our guidelines were, maybe that organization was able to purchase, you know? So working together, a lot of partnerships, networking. And I, I, I can tell you uh, one recommendation is really network. You know, host a networking meeting. Don't just say it's breastfeeding, just a networking meeting where you invite various organizations, various business, you know, people, and then invite them to, to network. Everybody's looking to try and instead of going to each and every place, uh, invite them to one place where they can all gather in and share. So let's move to the next phase about yeah. um, we've that's the covering the four stages. And we're yes. moving into tools or some resources or some activities. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. ahead, Elsa. Okay. Well, I think I kind of like mentioned some of that, you know, um, preparing and knowing your environment. Um, prepare your environment by hosting and yeah, a networking meeting or engaging partners in listening state uh, sessions. Um, uh, analyze your environment with a needs assessment, environmental scan, or community profile. And like I tell you, for us, I mean, just going to your um, public health uh, data, they also, they collect a lot of data, you know, regarding the needs that are out there, poverty level, the areas that need to be focused. Um, I know diabetes, you know, that's a biggie. Uh, heart disease is another one. So getting those partners because they do have a lot of funding and it doesn't have to be a, a big event either. You can have a small event within your community while you start up and um, analyze. Um, uh, you could also go to the US census. It also, I mean, right now, I think it's 20, uh, 2010 data but they'll be loading 2020 data soon, hopefully. And, but that's a good start, you know, just know, know your community. I know for our area, I, uh, that's one of the things that when we first started with the task force, everything was in English. And well, you know, I mean, they shared a lot of resources and they wanted us to share it with our, with our communities. But in our, especially in my community in the South, when you have about 90% of your population speak Spanish, um, no English information is gonna be helpful. Maybe the picture, but you know that not any other information. So knowing that also um, the culture in itself, um, I know this is not a biggie now, but we have, um, we also have an annual uh, breastfeeding calendar and um, businesses can actually um, be listed on there. Of course, it has to meet our, our guidelines. And so um, they can also get, you know, um, an, a small advertisement in there, but uh, about their services, usually it's organizations that do that. And so uh, with that, we had to actually, actually uh, we really, really, really uh, focused on it for being uh, diverse. It had to be diverse. People had to be able to identify themselves with that calendar. So it couldn't be just one race on, on that calendar. It had to be a, a, a variety. Um, so- I'm wondering you know, if anybody has variety. a comment about knowing your environment. Also, you've mentioned quite a bit about really knowing your environment in the, mm -hmm. um, in the border area and how that's really shaped how you developed your coalition. Mm -hmm. um, does anybody else have a comment about knowing your community, knowing your environment, and how that shapes your coalition? I'll share if nobody else wants to. I don't want to. I'm, I'm being an oversharer <laughs> today, so I'm trying to be sensitive oh, no, to that. Okay. You're fantastic. One of the things that actually benefited my situation was that I came moved to a new city eight months ago and this was a new thing that got kicked off. So I was forced to go out and know my environment and that has served us so well because I have knocked on every door and I just assumed that all the folks that I was working with had already kicked open those doors or were talking to each other and I found no, not at all. So like I gave you the example of the virtual coffee with the lactation consultants. 
those were people over time that had gotten passed down wrong information, or maybe 10 years ago, there was a bad relationship happening. But now people were hungry to meet together and share and talk and form a really collaborative relationship. So I love the, vi the visual you guys have because I love gardening. And I feel like that I'm doing that right now too, is just keeping um, visiting different gardens. And it's just mm -hmm. been so fun to see mm -hmm. that there are people that you wouldn't think would be wanting to come to the table who are at the table. So yeah, I love that. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's, it's a good activity to return to. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have, if you are struggling and you're stuck, a good activity to return to is maybe our environment has changed. Maybe our community has changed. Maybe the people mm -hmm. in our coalition have, there's been enough turnover that we don't have that knowledge within the coalition of what our environment is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, and then what used to work maybe 10 years ago, is not working anymore, you know, so we, we need to evolve, you know, mm -hmm. we do need to, you know, make those changes, you know, some of our, uh, some of our moms that were participating with us since the beginning, you know, they're, they're now with, in their fourth child or their children are gone, but they're still participating with us. But are we reaching the newer moms, you know, that type of thing, you know, so you got to make sure that we're constantly evolving, making sure touching base, making sure we're meeting the needs. So really, you should be visiting your everything uh, within your organization about every two years, because if you're still doing the same old thing that you were doing 20 years ago, 10 years ago, uh, yeah, you, it's not going to help. The other thing about that also that's been interesting here is that you know, obviously looking at me, I breastfed 20 years ago, right? So one of the things that's been interesting is the women that we're trying to reach now are a different mama than I was 20 years ago. They live on Instagram. So mm -hmm. one of the big changes we've made was we were doing a lot of, or the previous work in, in various projects that I'm part of a bigger team. This is just one little piece of it. Um, they were doing Facebook, Facebook, Facebook. But when it comes to lactation, it's Instagram, Instagram, Instagram. You know, a lot of those mamas and our other parents, other human milk feeding parents, they're not on Facebook, they're on Instagram. So we're shifting gears now and creating a new Instagram campaign to try to reach out to, to those parents. So that's been a real shift for my division is to start to think outside of, like you were saying, Elsa, what we were doing 10 years ago just doesn't work right now. Yeah. I, I can tell you, we found out that Instagram actually is old now. Uh, right, it's right. So old. I'm dating myself already. It's now TikTok. <laughs> yeah, that too. No, that too. Definitely. So it speaks to yeah, that you need to have a lot of young healthy. folks too. Like, exactly. you know, have a lot of young folks on our, on your team as yeah. well. So there's yeah. a question in the chat that's, a, um, people are just ahead of us because it's a perfect segue to the next slide that Pa's going to present. And it's about leadership and membership mm -hmm. and um, uh, so changing yeah. leadership and changing membership. So um, mm -hmm. perfect segue. Thank you, Kara. Thank you. Next slide. Yeah. Brenda, did you have something you wanted to say? Oh. No, that's okay. I, I'll, I'll go back to listening, but thank you for checking. Okay. Okay. If you have something to say, anybody just barge right in, unmute yourself and, and barge right in. Cause again, I can't see everybody. Um, Elsa, I love your passion and I love the wealth of knowledge that you have around breastfeeding coalitions and kind of like the stages. And so thank you so much. And I know like what Elsa had said, it's mm -hmm. a lot to dump on you guys. And so we won't have all of the answers in this session, mm -hmm. this two hour session. Mm -hmm. So please, 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 I encourage and urge you all to come back to the other T, uh, TA sessions that USBC is hosting because they will dive a little deeper into funding and into um, diversity, equity and inclusion and all of those other juicy topics. Okay, so. Happy Earth Day, sticking with the yeah, analogy of growing our um, yep. garden, you know, which is growing our uh, breastfeeding coalition or a lactation coalition. Once you prepare your soil, you kind of do your, you know, environmental scan. The next step is to plant your seeds. So again, this mm -hmm. is starting to talk a little bit more about leadership, 
membership. How does how does it start to look? You're planning out your garden, right? Where are you going to plant the potatoes? And where are you planting the tomatoes? And where are you planting the carrots? And so on and so forth. Okay. Mm -hmm. So planting the seeds to your coalition. This includes prioritizing and fostering leadership, right? Um, I know a lot of us are kind of stuck in the sense that we feel like the board is doing all of the, the, work, the work or there's not enough mm -hmm. members to take on some, um, to break, you know, to share some of the responsibilities of certain activities. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that and we'll do a little more sharing about that. Um, you want, when you're planting seeds, you want to make sure that leadership and activities come from and are based in the community. Again, going back to the community needs, right? That is how you keep your members engaged. That is how you keep uh, membership going. Um, when you do just a lot of meetings with a lot of talking, but not a lot of action, people lose interest quickly. And so making sure that leadership and activities go hand in hand with what is it that the community really needs, what the environment really needs. You learn about potential leaders and new projects from your community assessments. And then you personally invite folks to be part of the leadership team or be part of the coalition that you're building. So um, I'm gonna go back to the Hmong breastfeeding coalition that I'm a part of. This is a cultural coalition. Remember we were in the, we are still in the formation stage, um, but leadership in this cultural coalition looks different than the leadership that is in the Twin Cities Regional Breastfeeding Coalition. So in this mm -hmm. cultural coalition, um, all active members are leaders and leadership is shared amongst all of us. We usually in meetings or when there's uh, a vote to be made or kind of like the next steps, we usually defer to one another and we all hold, a, uh, we all hold the same amount of power. And usually things are decided on a majority rule basis um, so, you know, even if I really, 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 really want to apply to the Kellogg Foundation grant, if majority of my peers in the Hmong Breastfeeding Coalition says, you know, no, I just, we don't, we don't think that's the direction we want to go. I think we should stick with X, Y, and Z. Then I, okay, you know, I'm fine with that. And we let go of that opportunity or we don't take that opportunity on. Now, I would like you to think about examples of coalition or experiences that you have had and that you've experienced um, that are considered planting seeds. And if you can either unmute yourself and share, or if you wanna type that out in the chat, let's talk a little bit about what does this mean to plant seeds? Okay, so Brenda says, oh, I'm sorry. Kara says mm -hmm. our coalition used to be mostly hospital LCs, and now with new leadership, we're mostly community breastfeeding support, such as WIC, home visitors, doulas, but have lost the hospital representation. Oh. We may have swung too far in the other direction. Yep. Okay, hmm. and then Brenda answered and said, well, um, they, they, Brenda's coalition thought they did as well. One answer is that the Kansas Breastfeeding Coalition was in the creation of sections so that our members could be based on their interests. Very good. Yeah, like subcommittees mm -hmm. or, or chapters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have four sections. There's hospitals, there's childcare, public health, and local breastfeeding coalition. Brenda, I'll let you unmute yourself and explain a little more, please. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that was actually the brainchild of a hospital LC. <laughs> so she's <laughs> like, why don't we have these sections? And an unexpected outcome of doing these sections, we thought they would be like interest groups, is that we started getting state partners, agencies and organizations that would join a section that had no interest in being a part of the state coalition because breastfeeding was just a small uh, slice of their pie, if you will. So um, childcare is a perfect example. We got a lot of childcare um, agencies and organizations involved in the childcare section that didn't really have the time and capacity to be part of a larger conversation about breastfeeding, but they've created mm -hmm. some fantastic tools just for childcare, the intersection of childcare and breastfeeding. So I just give that as an yeah. example. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's good. 
Brenda, thank you for sharing. That's yes. Sure. So, so you're right to diversify your membership, right? Your membership reach. Uh, like Elsa said, there's some there's some legwork you have to put in there. You got to really put yourself out. But when you start to when you have the capacity or when you're ready and your your coalition has evolved and grow enough where you're ready to split off into groups of you know interests or what really what what is really passionate for a certain uh, coalition members may not be so passionate for others. If you're able to finally get to that point in your coalition, that is another way for you to be able to diversify your mm -hmm. membership mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. group or list and also then the funding as well. So thank you, Brenda, for that. Um, anybody else? Does anyone else want to share maybe their, a, an example of their coalition or an experience that they, their coalition had gone through with planting seeds, with the activity of planting seeds? Uh, I'd like to um, just reflect on uh, the Hmong Breastfeeding Coalition, just as this is Linda Kopecki, so I've been working with the Hmong Breastfeeding Coalition since you know the very first needs assessment and listening session and getting it launched. But um, when I think about planting seeds, I think specifically about the Hmong Breastfeeding Coalition, that every listening session, it seemed like one more member and leader jumped mm -hmm. on board. And then there would be another listening session and another person was you know, interested and realized that was their passion and they jumped on board. Or each activity, it was uh, like over time, each bit of outreach or each activity brought in yet another person. So it was a very interesting process for de developing leadership. Yes, thank you, Linda. Thank you. Okay. So with that, we will go on to the next slide, please. And I'll turn the time back over to Elsa for the next activity. Okay. So for this one, um, watering and fertilizing. Um, to grow coalitions, um, you should look for resources beyond public health. That was the concern that we had with, uh, especially with uh, the New Mexico Breastfeeding Task Force at one time, because most, I can tell you, we had our, we, we started a conference. That was our main revenue um, builder was the, an annual conference that we started. And the problem with it, and the nice part was, well, it was good. It was a plus and a minus. The good thing is uh, because the New Mexico WIC promotions uh, manager was uh, involved, she would send all her nutritionists and then um, some, sometimes, depending on the funding that they, they received, um, she would send them to the conference. And so they, that would, they would pay um, for the conference. The problem with that is when you have um, too many from one organization, if something was to happen with that funding um, that, that that actually did happen, um, it, you go from 300 participants in a conference to maybe about 100, you know? And so that really pinches, you know, you get we really get pinched there. So really diversify um, look, start looking at what we learned, what I learned, you know, what we learned was it had to be outside of the box. You had to start looking at other resources or other members, uh, other people. Um, so start looking at your social workers, start looking at your, again, speech pathologists, start looking at um, your nurses, you know, inviting them. Um, you know, you start, you really start looking at different resources. I don't believe in recreating the wheel. If there's already a wheel out there, we just need to tailor it to ours, you know? Um, and so, or I mean, we might be able to use and ask them if we are able to use it. And so, you know, um, really looking at those resources. A lot of people have put a lot of money and effort in creating things that your coalition may be able to utilize and you don't have to do, you know, uh, work so hard. Uh, smaller co coalitions, find community partners, you know, within your community, you'd be surprised, you know, like I tell you, community health workers, uh, association, um, gosh, we, if it's a really small community, like our communities are very small, we only have a, a couple of thousands of people in population, um, where I'm at in, in, in our areas, um, it, it really makes a difference that if you uh, connect with 
um, the water company, you know, the gas company, do some uh, some sort of activity, community activity, where you can have a booth providing information. I know um, uh, one of our biggie ones for for our area was participating in in one of our city, near uh, nearby cities uh, in New Mexico, they had a Renaissance fair. And so we would have a lactation station station there. There's thousands of people coming to that event, you know, um, from all over. And they'd have an, an area where they, the, the nursing mom, or even if a mom needed to change a baby, you know, cause we had our, our changing tables, they could go there and then we talked to them about breastfeeding. You know, they would sit there because we had our rocking chairs. It was really nice, you know, uh, tent and all of that, you know, are, are like I tell you, the task force, you would just uh, tell them what idea you wanted and you put put out a little proposal of what it is that you wanted. And so we told them we need a table, chairs, a rocking chair, a tent, you know, to be able to do that. So th really thinking outside of the uh, of the box. Um, don't just focus on just health. It, it doesn't have to be just health people. I mean, it could be business people coming in. They, and that I, I can tell you that's how, um, you know, they already know me. You know, they, they know me that if they have, they'll ask me, hey, Elsa, I have $20,000 that I got to use before the end of the fiscal year. Do you have an idea? Oh, yeah, heck yeah, I do. You know, so have those ideas already available, you know, because this way, you know, if, if, that those opportunities come come to your door, you're able to fulfill those, uh, act, you know, the, that fulfill and help you'd be scratching their back and they're scratching yours. Um, identify uh, for smaller, again, those were the smaller um, coalitions. Uh, larger coalitions um, to act as physical agents, like, like I told you with the New Mexico Breastfeeding Task Force, that's what it is. It started off with their Breastfeeding Peer Counselor Program. And I know they started branching out uh, before I, I started um, uh, doing the transition to focus more on the Binational Breastfeeding Coalition. They were already incorporating the Community Health Worker Association in there and, and trying to build on that. Um, identify community resources that are uh, help to help improve uh, operations, again, um, it's nice when the uh, American Heart Association tells us, you know what, we have $20,000. Do you guys, do you guys want to do something? Um, and we're like, yes, we have our lecture series and we'd like to pay our speakers and pay our CNEs and for our CNEs or LSERPs. And it's nice because all we have to do is uh, they handle everything, the logistics, everything. All we, all we do is we meet and we decide who the speakers are. And of course, you know, we get our own evaluation and stuff, but it's nice when some other bigger organization can handle like the accountability stuff and the monies and all that. So Those are great ideas. Really, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, Training and diversity, equity, and inclusion, that's very crucial. Um, don't assume that everybody knows that, you know. It's very important why you want to diversify, you know. Um, I know that was pretty hard for us. We were just, I don't remember which organization it was or which coalition it was, that it was mainly hospital people. Ours started that way. It was just mainly hospital people and WIC people. The problem with it is when... Uh, we couldn't go, you know, they wouldn't pay us anymore to go to the meetings. You know, our meetings started getting smaller and smaller. Participation started getting smaller and smaller. So then we had to diversify. That's, you know, that's a whole idea there is we started networking and trying to get other people involved. And then we started uh, when there, when you take ownership, nobody has to pay you to go to a coalition that you really believe or, or, or uh, want to participate in, you know, the, it, you go, on, I would go on my own. I travel, I would travel from where I'm at to Albuquerque. It's about 300 miles, you know? So you're talking 600 miles round trip just for me to be the voice of Southern New Mexico. But I'm, I was just so passionate about it, you know? And I said, from that, like I tell you, we diversified and we actually branched out and we started our chapters to be able to meet the needs of the entire state, not just the metropolitan area. And so um, compensating leadership and participation. Well, 
uh, until we started getting a lot of the funding from Kellogg's, uh, really it became Kellogg's, the Kellogg's grant. Um, that's when we were able to, we started off with paying uh, for a part-time executive director. And then we were able to demonstrate that, you know, we were responsible and we could grow. And then um, it, it, to the point now we have a full-time executive director. Actually, they branched out and um, later on, I don't know, you know, if it's something that we can, we went through, we went to a consulting um, agency who handles all the employment part because we wanted to make sure that if they if they were gonna be employees of the New Mexico Breastfeeding Task Force, uh, as the board decided that they, we wanted to make sure that they also had benefits. And so uh, when you go with a consulting agency, um, it, they do get, you know, some, uh, they do get paid for that. And so sometimes you can pay for it depending on the amount of grant that you get. Um, but what was nice about it, it, it really taught us how to really run a business, you know, really mm -hmm. the business piece of it. And so, so thanks, so yeah, that's the, how it goes. Uh, the next section is really about, but I want to comment really quickly about this resource, the Coalition's Learning Connection. Yes. We're yes. going to make sure that the follow-up emails and the follow-up information on the USBC site have some resources. We've mentioned a few resources today already. Um, mm -hmm. The Coalition's Learning Connection is definitely a valuable one mm -hmm. in connecting with other coalitions. Um, but those will be available to you. They'll be sent to you. So let's move to the, the next one really quickly. We're 15 minutes left and we're, we're really doing well on time. This is great. Um, this is Linda. I'm just going to speak quickly about companion planting. If there's any gardeners out there, they know what companion planting <laughs> is. It's planting different kinds of plants next to each other because they can benefit each other or they protect each other or they um, some plants can ward away certain pests that are common to the plant they're um, next to. So this is, we've talked a lot about partnerships um, and this is really about partnerships. So just some ideas, uh, interacting with experts within and outside of the lactation field. So don't limit yourself to lactation professionals. And this is for coalitions of all sizes, the brand new small coalitions and larger, um, more um, more established coalitions. So think about who else is uh, you know, who else is working in a field that relates to infant feeding and first foods. Mm -hmm. So epidemiology, mm -hmm. child care, childbirth, mm -hmm. community health, mm -hmm. culturally based organizations. In Minnesota, we're starting to work with food pantries. Um, mm -hmm. That's a that's a partner that we haven't really considered, but we're trying to branch out and. Um, we've been working with infant mortality, community-based projects, and um, child care programs. So what, what about finding a mentor coalition or an individual? So being a mentor or seeking a mentor, and definitely the coalition learning connection through USBC, or even the conference in June mm -hmm. might be a mm -hmm. perfect place for finding that mentor that you're looking for or finding another coalition that you can mentor. And then the last one is really work on your listening skills. When you're working with partners, uh, listen to what their priorities are, their needs mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. um, because it, uh, Shirley, you know, Shirley Chisholm said, you know, if they didn't invite you to the table, bring your, your folding chair to the table. Um, <laughs> So, you know, and so as you, the lactation professionals and the lactation subject matter experts, you have a folding chair and you can pick that up mm -hmm. and take that to other tables and work on your, your listening. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, feel mm -hmm. free to put comments or questions in the chat, but we're going to move to the last section and then USBC has some final comments. Thank you, Linda. So this is uh, the last, or I should say one of the last actions um, would be pruning and dividing. So let's say you worked hard, you toiled, you, you know, had mm -hmm. sweat uh, and you have established your garden. Now what comes next? It's pruning and dividing, right? So you've heard Elsa and I talked a little bit about like diversifying your funding, diversifying your membership, your leadership, um, you know, 
that that comes down to pruning and dividing. You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. Like Elsa had alluded earlier, if you have a lot of hospital staff or medical staff, if there's a funding that gets cut, all of a sudden your coalition goes from 50 people to all of a sudden 10 or 15 because majority of them uh, no longer have the time or compensation to attend your coalition meetings and activity. So pruning and dividing, know when to slow down or trim back on activities. I know that the COVID pandemic has done that to all of us and we've had to prune and divide no matter what stage of um, the growing and evolution stage our coalition was at. Um, number two, identifying the right time to develop new activities, groups, or coalitions. Mm -hmm. So again, going back to what Brenda had put in um, mm -hmm. the chat box, that, you know, maybe maybe all of a sudden your coalition is at that point where you can break up into smaller groups of interest so that you can continue to grow and branch out um, and partner with unconventional partners or non-traditional partners. Um, and then thirdly, learn how to be responsive to changing circumstances. So I'm gonna give you an example. The Twin Cities Regional Breastfeeding Coalition, majority of our leadership team were from public health. Well, when the COVID pandemic hit, a lot of us, if not all of us, were reassigned to our COVID department response. And all of a sudden we left a big void in the coalition's leadership team. Um, and so, I, I want you to think about, again, diversifying, right? Like thinking about how do you, how can you divide and conquer? How can you prune and divide, right? When, when is it that you need to scale back a little because there's a pandemic going on or because there's some, um, there's some situation in your community that's going on? All right. Um, with that, feel free to add or put into the chat um, anything that you maybe came to mind, spark your mind about pruning and dividing um, so that we can continue to go from there. But with that, I will turn the time back over to Danae and Miriam to kind of wrap up this session and give some announcements. Thanks, Pat. Uh, Linda, I'm just gonna give a couple final comments. Um, and I just wanna comment on Anna's mentioned in the chat that they do, do a member spotlight speaker each month. But then that is a really good way to get new partners. And if you remember those different stages of coalition, um, as, as a coalition evolves through those stages, that leadership goes from you know, predominantly public health or hospital-based or WIC-based to more and more community members as members leaders and it's a really diverse leadership. So that's definitely a, a hallmark of that coalition evolving that you will have more community members engaged and in leadership positions. Um, so just a quick um, couple, a few things just to take away is when remember your whole garden. So not just your coalition, but how are you interacting with other coalitions in your area? Um, and then each coalition has a, has a different timeline. So um, eventually all coalitions will evolve through those stages, uh, but you're gonna have a different timeline from the coalition next to you. Uh, but evolving does mean increasing in diversity, adding more community members, um, codifying your policies and procedures. And then check in regularly. We talked about, you know, always you know, circle back and do a needs assessment or circle back and make sure you're including all voices. Um, pause and just take stock and make sure that you are definitely responding to the needs of the community and you're including the needs of the community and the voices of the community. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, thank you everyone for such a wonderful session, such great conversation. Um, so we are going to give a couple of updates and Danae will be sharing in the chat box a satisfaction link um, to today's session. So it takes no longer than maybe five minutes to complete and it will definitely help us as we design the future sessions. 
So if you can do that. Um, our upcoming sessions, please save the date for these next two sessions, trauma and breastfeeding and communication styles and methods. We look forward to seeing you all there. And we know that every coalition is unique as we mentioned. And as such, every coalition has unique needs and you can now request a technical assistance form um, from the USBC for your coalition through a brief online form. Um, you can simply provide your contact information, including the name of your coalition and a brief summary of the TA assistance that you need. And we'll be sure to follow up and Danae can share that link in the chat. Thank you, Danae. And finally, if you enjoyed today's session, you will not wanna miss out on the 2021 National Conference and convening. I know Linda mentioned it as well. Um, this will be held fully online and we will cover advocacy, um, community resistance, resilience, and emergency and preparedness um, response. So there will be opportunity for networking um, and registration is open. Um, and if your coalition is a member, there will be a discount. Um, that's a $100 discount on the registration for all your coalition members. Um, this conference will be held from June 9th to the 11th and continuing education is pending. So stay tuned for those kinds of updates. And if you have any questions about that, um, please email conference at usbreastfeeding.org. And if you have any specific questions about membership, um, you can email membership at usbreastfeeding.org. And with that, thank you so much to everyone for joining us and for all that you do. Um, thank you, Linda and Elsa and Pa, and we'll see you all next time. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. This is wonderful. Thank you. Bye.